family has been so blessed uh, by a promise that uh, was given to Yvonne and Brendan and Angela's father that, that, uh, that we would have music in our family. And so um, I would like for, and again, I don't get to do this very often, so I get to tell them what to do right now. I would like for my girls uh, to come and sing the song that they sang at uh, the Christmas play last night. Um, and then also I'd like for Brenda and Imagine when your mom was singing tonight. I, I can ask that from here. Now if I ask them at home, I might get punched in the head. But uh, from here I can ask it. So uh, I'd just like to like to allow that promise to kind of lead the worship today, if that's okay. So we're going to have Deanna and my girls sing, and then uh, Brenda and Badger will move on.
time we'll go ahead and have a few. Salvation. 
I know where my power and my strength come from. Come on, yeah, but in my weakness, His power is yeah. uh, I'm in Matthew chapter 6. I can't get away from it. Uh, me and some brothers were, were talking about it. It's been 10, weeks, or 10 days or 2 weeks ago or so. And can't get away from it. Uh, I feel like maybe I clenched the spirit a little bit last week and not speaking up because Brother Eric... Uh, talking a lot about worry, what are you worried about? And, and Jesus here in, in chapter 6 is talking a lot about money and about worry. And that is definitely something right now that the world is, 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 is thinking about. It's on our minds, especially this time of year. We're worried about money. Yes, sir. We're worried about uh, time. And all those things, all they do is lead to anxiety. And that's not our Father's will. And what happens there is we, we lose our focus. Come on. All right, we don't we don't really celebrate this season the way that we should. We take our eyes off the cross and off of that perfect gift that was given to us. You see, when the angels came and they, they gave the news to Mary, or they said they wanted to bring good tidings. That word tidings means it's another word for news. And what's the gospel mean? It's good news. Jesus Christ is the good news that was sent down for us. And so I'm in Matthew chapter 6. Uh, Jesus, this is uh, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached uh, or taught. It, it says that Jesus was teaching to the multitudes. And I don't think it tells us how many, but I just imagine just, just, just like when he, when he fed the 5,000 plus. I, I feel like there was that many or maybe even more. But he was sitting, he was preaching or teaching to the multitudes. And... He's talking about the characteristics that God looks for in believers, in, in followers uh, of Christ, and uh, how we're supposed to think, and how we're supposed to act, and treat other people. And so, um, in, in this particular passage that I'm, that I'm going to start with, I'm starting in, in, in chapter 6, verse 19. Uh, it's, it's a very familiar passage. You guys have read this probably dozens of times. But uh, he's teaching about money, and he's teaching about worry, and then he's teaching about where we should really be focused uh, toward, toward the end of this. And so, um, the wisest man that ever walked the earth other than Jesus was Solomon. And he said, this is what he said in Proverbs, he said, labor not to be rich. He said, cease from thine own wisdom. Now, this is the smartest man. Yeah according to the Bible, that ever walked the earth besides Jesus. And he's telling us not to work, to be rich. He's telling us to cease from our own wisdom. Okay? And so in verse 19 it says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. Now, why do we not do that? Why do we not lay up for ourselves treasures upon the earth? Well, Paul told Timothy over in the 1 Timothy chapter 6, he says, But godliness and with contentment, okay? Godliness is what we're supposed to be striving uh, uh, to reach. Uh, Jesus said, Be ye therefore perfect, even as your Father in heaven is perfect. So we, even though we'll never reach that perfection, we're supposed to be striving through these characteristics that he's, that he's preaching to us. That's how we're supposed to be molding our lives to be more like him. Okay? And so Paul told Timothy, he said, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and it's certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and clothing, let us be there with content. Say that again. Having food and clothes, we should be content. I'll add one more thing. We got Jesus. We got it all. It says, but they that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare, and into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. For the love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith, and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. 
And then Paul says this, But though thou, O man of God, flee from these things and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Now that's the characteristics that a true believer is supposed to have. Okay? And so we don't lay up treasures for ourselves on earth. But we're supposed to lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust is corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. And Jesus, this is Jesus. This is red letters here. This is Jesus talking to us. Okay? He's, he's basically saying your heart cannot be in two places at one time. Either your heart is focused on heavenly things or your heart is focused on earthly things. And he's saying, moth and rust corrupts those things. Yep. Thieves can break through and steal those things. But the things that we store up in heaven, if our heart is laying up treasures in heaven and focused on Jesus Christ, oh, and Him alone, nothing that can never be taken away from us. Okay? And so he gives this really good illustration here in verses 22 and 23. And I've struggled with this for a little while, even though it is, maybe I made things a little bit harder than it had to be. But... Uh, I have to ask this question. What are your eyes focused on? Okay? And so, in, in verse 22, he says, The light, or the lamp of the, of the eye, sorry, the light, or lamp of the body, is the eye. If, therefore, thine eye be single, or good, or healthy, thy whole body shall be full of light. And so, what are your eyes focused on? If your eyes are focused on good things, on healthy things, on heavenly things, and then the whole rest of your body is filled with that light, okay? Now, you can't mix darkness and light. It happened. Jesus was the light that came in the world, into the world, and darkness comprehended it not. Okay? It, it's not possible to mix darkness and light. And so if you're focused on the good things, Right? You have a singular focus on Jesus, the rest of your body, your whole body, will be full of light. Now, in verse 23, but if thine eye be evil or bad or unhealthy or focused on the things of this world, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And so what are your eyes focused on. I think of some really good, first, John warned us uh, over in 1 John. He's, well, and also, he said, so, what are your eyes fixed on? Alright? Is it worldly things? Is it heavenly things? John reminds us to love not the world. Neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passes away. And the lust thereof. But he that does the will of God abides forever. Now, I can think of some really good biblical examples of people who've lost their focus and lost... Uh, uh, just their sight of Jesus, though, their sight of what God had, had meant for them. Obviously, Adam and Eve is a really good example. They took their eyes off of what God had, had commanded them to do, and, and Eve put her eyes on the lust uh, of the eyes in the apple. And she took it and wanted to do it, separated them from God. Okay? Uh, what happened to Lot's wife when she looked back? Turned into a pillar of salt. She wasn't focused on what God had told her to do. That's what she was supposed to do. Okay? Uh, think about uh, the Israelites when they were wandering around in the wilderness and God sent judgment in the form of fiery serpents. And uh, God told Moses to make a brass serpent and put it up in the middle of the camp. And if any man would be bit by a snake, if all they had to do was look at that brass serpent and they would live. And that brass serpent was made to be a type of Christ for them that all they had to do was believe and trust that if they looked at that serpent, uh, that they would live. Okay? And so salvation could be obtained by what your eyes are focused on. All right? Think about what happened to Peter when he stepped out of the boat on the water. Whenever he took his eyes off of Jesus, what happened? He began to sink. Uh, think about 
this is a good example of one who had their mind focused on the right things, and that is Stephen in, in, in the book of Acts. Uh, he would be, uh, become the first martyr of the early church and be killed for his faith. Uh, it says that uh, in, the, in the midst of his trial, after he gave his account, uh, knowing his faith that he was getting ready to die, he was looking steadfastly up into the heaven, and he sees the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And now, that's a great example of one who, in the midst of his trials, in the midst of facing death, he knew he was about to die and be stoned to death for his faith. He still had his eyes fixed on Jesus. And that's what he sees the glory of God. And so, I ask, what are your eyes focused on? Is it the things of heaven? Or is it the things of the earth? And so, in verse 24, no man can serve. That word there means literally to be a slave to. No man can serve two masters. Now, a master is a lord or owner. What owns you? Is it Jesus or is it things of the world? For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. I'm reminded that when Jesus, when, when, when Jesus was led into the wilderness by the Spirit, Satan took him up on a high mountain and showed him all the kings and the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them. And he said, Satan said to Jesus, uh, all these things I'll give to you if you'll fall down and worship me. And Jesus said unto him, Get thee hence, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God and him only shalt thou serve. Okay? Joshua said, If it seem evil to you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve. Whether the gods which, which your father serves that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I'm thinking, what, what is the Lord of my life? What owns me? Uh, where am I laying up my treasures? Uh, am I seeking to please God? Or am I seeking to please man? For if I please men, I should not be the servant of Christ. That's who we're supposed to serve. James says, A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. But the man who trusts in the Lord with all his heart, and he's not on his own understanding, in all his ways, acknowledges him. You can direct your path. There aren't two paths. There's only one path. There's only one way to get to heaven. Is it things of the world? Or is it earthly things? Is it Jesus? It is. And so what is the result? I think maybe the result of serving two masters. And now you cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon is riches, earthly treasures, wealth, your property, the things that you own. You can't serve one that your heart can't be with your property and the things that you own and be with God. You can't. Okay, it's not possible. And so what's the result of serving? That's a result of serving two masters. Listen to what Jesus is, taught, is, is saying to the church of Laodicea. Now, this church was, was known as a wealthy church. They had riches. He says, I know thy works. Thou art neither, hot, ne thou art neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. God is disgusted with double-mindedness. He's disgusted with lukewarmness. There's no gray area. Nobody likes anything that is lukewarm. I love coffee. I like it hot or cold. I don't like it lukewarm. A lot of people like iced coffee. A lot of people like this hot and hot. Okay? That's the way I take it. But lukewarm coffee, I want to spew that out of my mouth. That's terrible. And that's what God thinks about us when we are lukewarm in our in our faith toward Him. Alright? And so he says, 
Because you are lukewarm, because you're double minded, because you need a hot or cold. You can't be both. You can't have one foot in and one foot out. He says, Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, have need of nothing. And knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. You see, the church of Laodicea didn't realize that. They didn't know that they were actually wretched, miserable, and poor and blind and naked. See, they were focused more on their riches and what they had. And that they were just kind of giving lip service to God. They were just going through the motions. And they were neither hot nor cold. God wants us to be on fire for Him. Okay? And so, back to Matthew 6. Jesus gives us a remedy for the things that worry us. Uh, for the things that cause anxiety in our life. Uh, and that's to trust in the providential care of God. He'll provide all things. Listen to what he says. He says it many times, but, but think about it. He says, take no thought. That means do not worry about it. He says, therefore I say unto you, listen how many times he says this. Though. He says, take no thought for your life, what you shall eat, what you shall drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on. Is not life more than meat, and the body more than raiment? And he gives some really good examples here. All right. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather in the barns, yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much better than they? Which of you, by taking thought, or which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Now, in other words, that means worrying will not add anything to your life. It will not add another moment to your life. It will not add another rich thing of this world to your life. Worry doesn't do anything but create further stress and anxiety. Okay? So he says, don't take thought for, for that. Don't worry. And then he says, and why take you thought for raiment? Gives a good example here. He says, consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, meaning they don't work hard, they don't labor, they're not weary for anything. Neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. And so he's, he's talking about how something was clothed. He said Solomon in all his glory. Solomon was richer and wiser than any other king on earth. He drank out of gold uh, cups. Silver wasn't good enough. He drank out of gold. Uh, I think the temple that, that, that he had built was made out of some of the most precious stones that you can find on the earth. But he says, and Solomon in all his glory was not raised like one of these. And so, verse 30, Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you? Oh, ye of little faith. How many yeah, times yeah. has Jesus said that? Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> what do we have to be afraid of here? What do we have to worry about? Here? The one who created all things, even you, cares about you, about every little thing, and he will provide. <coughs> Worrying will not provide for you. Taking thought for things. Letting things of the world dominate your thoughts and your mind and your actions. They don't lead to heavenly treasure. And so in 31, in verse 31, he says, Therefore take no thought, or do not worry, or have no anxiety about, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For after all these things did the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knows that you have need of all these things. He knows what you have need of. And so, over in Hebrews, it says, Let your conversation be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. 
For he hath said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. That's right. So that we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper, and I will not fear what man shall do unto me. Yeah. <coughs> Paul said in Philippians, to be careful for nothing, to be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. Yeah. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. And I think about Paul. Uh, he was a great example of one who learned to learn from him. Because uh, he said in Philippians, he said he knows both how to be abased, which means that he knows how to have or have not or how to be low. And I know how to abound, he said. How to be increased with me, to have. Okay? So he knows how to how to live whether he has or has not. And he, he, he learns to be content in all things. Okay? And so I think about Jesus too. He said the foxes have holes, the birds have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. I know that this is Jesus. We're talking about God in the flesh, but he's never worried in the world. And he showed that to us. He's the greatest example we can ever have for how we should walk, how we should act, how we should think. But even God said in the Old Testament, He said, I, I've surely seen the affliction of my people, which are in Egypt. I've heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, and I know their sorrows. He said in Deuteronomy, For the Lord thy God has blessed thee in all thy works of thy hand. He knoweth thy walking through his great wilderness. These forty years the Lord thy God hath been with thee, and thou hast lacked nothing. He provided the whole time. Through that forty years of wandering in the wilderness, they never went without. And yet they still complained. Time and time again they complained. They murmured. And this is one that really stuck out to me over in Psalms. Uh, he said, For he knoweth our frame, and he remembereth that we are dust. We're dust. He formed man from the dust of the ground and breathed breath of life into his lungs. We're dust. When we, can, when we can really be humble and really think about where we came from, we should be really grateful. For the little things that we take so for granted this, this, this time of year, like food and clothes. And so, verse 33, a very familiar verse. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. And so, that should be priority number one seeking after the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Priority number one. If we do that, listen to what it says. If we seek the kingdom of God first and His righteousness, it says all these other things will be added unto you. Food, clothing, anything you have need of, the Father knows about it. He knows what you have need of before you even ask. And so if we seek Him first, and not things of the world, but, but earthly, but heavenly things, uh, uh, if, if, if we have our sights on those things, then all these other things that we worry about and that creates anxiety in our lives shall be added unto us. And so in verse 34, it says, Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Right. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof or the trouble thereof. We don't know what tomorrow holds. And we know that our life, over in James, our life is but a vapor. It's here one day and then it goes away. So why worry? Why are we so worried about these things that really don't matter? We need to worry about heavenly things, not earthly things, not worldly things, not our riches, not our money, not our bank accounts, or 401ks, or what kind of cars we're driving, what kind of shoes we're wearing. Uh, none of that stuff. All that stuff creates anxiety, but it's given us, the great physician has given us a plan for how we're to overcome worry about riches. 
that we're to trust in His care. He's going to provide everything that we need. Now all we have to do is seek Him first. Seek Him first. Seek the kingdom of God and His righteousness. Now, if we seek after, if we do that, if we seek after Him first, and when I wake up in the morning and I pray and I'm able to read some scripture before I start my day, I'm di I feel different. Okay, I'm different. My day is not different. It's still the same old crummy day that I had the day before. But I've chose that morning to fill myself up with the right things well, instead of today's troubles. Okay? If I fill myself up with today's troubles and the things that I have to do that are on my workload and, and paperwork or whatever it is that I have to do or bills that I have to pay, taxes I have to pay, uh, cars broke down, got to get it fixed, whatever. Those are the troubles that create anxiety in us. But you see, the peace of God can overcome all those things if we yeah. seek Him first. Yeah. Instead of the troubles and worries uh, which lead to anxiety, no, it don't lead to anything uh, of any gain for us. And, and if we can, at this time, I don't know what, I don't know what time it is. Huh? Can we get a, can we get a song? And I want to ask, uh, I want to remind you to fix your eyes on Jesus. Fix your eyes on the thing that really matters. Uh, not just in this season, okay? We don't just fix our eyes on Jesus around Christmas and Easter. It's a daily thing. Seek ye first daily. <coughs>